Hello, Decide Your Destiny crew, the Decide Your Destiny family and the community. So great to have you tuning in once again for another brilliant podcast episode where I've got an amazing guest sitting opposite me, someone who I think really resonates with the message um, in this community and can really share a lot of insights and things that we can implement to further decide our own destiny and take charge of our lives. So really excited to announce Lisa Evans as my guest for today. She is the Director of Speaking Savvy and she's a public speaking and business storytelling coach and trainer. And more than that, she pulls on her long history of being a midwife and all the things that she's had to manage in that world and she combines that with her own flavor of coaching and training so yeah i'm really excited lisa thanks for joining me thank you so much for inviting me kyle i'm super excited and thank you for that lovely introduction no worries no worries thank you for coming down so i guess let's start with you know your career as a as a, as a midwife because you know we've spoken before and you know for the for the listeners um Lisa and I have known each other for about a year now. We've been getting to know each other a bit more, but we definitely had that sort of connection. I think we have that similarity of that calmness, that kind of intuition that's inbuilt. And I think a lot of our history or time spent in maybe hospital areas has me as the patient, you, you as um, helping out the patient. But yeah, I guess I'd love to learn a little bit more about your, you know, your, your time as a midwife. Yeah. So ever since I was little, I knew I always knew that I wanted to be a nurse. I used to bandage my my dolls, and I'm from London, and we actually had a there was a a, a doll hospital uh, where you could actually take your teddies and your dolls to be repaired. This was in the day where teddies were jointed and and dolls were were jointed. Wow. So sometimes their arms and legs or their heads would fall off, <laughs> and Mum would take me on the bus to the doll hospital, yep. and the dolls would get get repaired. Yep. And I remember one day the the nurse at the doll hospital, she handed me the, the doll after she'd bandaged its head back on <laughs> and she said, Now Lisa, you take the doll back home and you take really good care of her. And it was at that moment that I was like, Wow, you know, this this person wasn't obviously wasn't a real nurse. Yeah. Uh, but she was in charge of the doll hospital and I just was oh, I felt so grown up that she'd given me this really responsible thing to do to look after this this doll so that her head would heal and she would become my favourite doll again. And I did. I went home and I, I nursed her and that was really the seed that was planted. I was probably around huh. six or seven and I started my nursing career as soon as I could. So I was about 17 and three quarters, had to wait and then I began my, my training. So initially it's three years to be a general nurse and then an extra uh, almost two years to become a midwife. The training's changed a little bit now. You don't have to be a nurse to be a midwife. But back then when I did my training many years ago, that was the the pathway that you did. So then I was a registered midwife and then I specialised and I did some further training of around a year and I became a neonatal intensive care midwife. So looking wow. after prem babies born early on life support. Wow. Very challenging high tech area of nursing but I really just took to it and I kind of liked that fast pace and yep. I liked the intensity of it, the adrenaline and the sort of excitement, uh, very rewarding. So I'd really found my calling early, you know, quite early in my life. I'd done all my training by the time I was 23. I was pretty much finished all, all my training. And that was the job that I thought that I'd be doing for the rest of my life, really. Wow, mm. that's amazing. It's, it's like, you know, you were given this gift, this, uh, this opportunity, okay, you know, we need you to look after this doll. And it was <laughs> yeah. kind of like, oh, you're putting, passing the baton over to me and, and this expectation. It's like, okay, so I've got, to, I've got to transform in a way. I've got to learn. I've got to make sure I, 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 you know, I change my habits. I really look after this doll to make sure it's, you know, it, it's healthy. And so no wonder you kind of, when you went to the, the next stage of what you wanted to be as a midwife in that fast-paced environment, of course, when that calling came, you jumped right in. So... Can I ask you a question? This is a question that I, I often get asked, um, well, you know, I, I often people ask, you know, what that reality is between um, what is shown visually and, and what is reality. So, you know, through TV shows and maybe some medical TV shows, 
you know, is it is it all that running around or is there something, <laughs> is there a level of calmness and stoicism? Sort yeah, of? absolutely. So the, the TV shows where, you know, there's an emergency and people yeah. are racing around corridors and there's sort of blue, blue lights and drama and it all seems a bit chaotic. It's not like that at all because yeah. that wouldn't be safe and a practical way to get the job done. So in any emergency, whether it's adults, kids or whoever it is, you know, the team come together, everybody is absolutely trained and knows what their piece of the job is. Everybody comes together to get it done and there's a, a manner of calmness mm. that that takes place and everybody is really focused on on their on their task but of course you've got to remain level headed and 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 think rationally yes. uh, which can be hard initially when you've got a life in front of you and yeah. that that there is the difference between that person making it or or not and of course in in nursing and midwifery and, and medicine, there's there's also the the ordinary days as well. It's not always running around saving yeah. saving lives. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's that that whole perception of reality. Yeah, and, and yeah. The story. So uh, after I finished my all my, all my training, I um I, I wanted to go to. I had it in my head again. I probably saw a show on TV that I wanted to go and work in the US. Okay. And in order to get the green card that it was back then, I don't know what it is now, I had to do an exam and it was quite a bit of studying to do this particular exam to allow me to go into the US. So I went through a recruitment company and I got offered this position in a neonatal intensive care unit in California, pending on me getting this little piece of, of paper. Yep. And so I bought myself this sort of, I remember it was a fat yellow textbook and I think I had about eight weeks to be able to read and sit this exam. And then that was the ticket into California. Wow. And in the meantime, I saw an ad in a newspaper for a short-term contract at a Sydney hospital. Wow. So I answered that ad and I found myself in Sydney and I had vivid images of me laying on Bondi Beach with my <laughs> thick yellow textbook study in this exam to be a nurse in America and that never happened. So yeah. <laughs> Australia became my adopted adopted country and like many people I meet who call Australia home, often we end up here by accident. You know, it's yep. a trip or a holiday or a love or or something that sparked your, your interest and you end up, you know, six months turns into a year, turns into a lifetime. So for me it was supposed to be an, an a twelve week trip. I had a 12-week sort of contract and then I was meant to be going back and then ultimately moving to California. It was one of those, you know, those sliding doors moments yes. where sometimes I think, I wonder how life would have been different if I had gone to California rather than yep. in Sydney. Yes, yeah. Who, who knows? <laughs> and, well, I guess part of that is the recreation. Like you're definitely not shy of recreating yourself and I think if you if you would have gone to other pla either place, do you think you would have kind of ended up where you are in terms of your career now? So because you started your new business at the age of 50, so you've yeah. come through that that history of being a midwife, of I guess knowing from the age of six, which mm. is very early, you know, for someone to yeah. know what they want to do, and then all that time spending and kind of coming up the ranks and, and, and I guess it also allowing you to travel. And then yeah. and then now you're helping leaders you know, in their business and, and, and you're, you know, an incredible speaker and, you know, sharing stories and that's where your heart and passion is. Do you think you would have always ended up at, at this destination? I don't think so. I uh -huh. think that I was, I mean, these days people have portfolio careers and there's lots of opportunities and pathways. Yep. You know, when I was going through school and high school, there was that expectation that you'd pick a career and you'd stick with that career and yeah maybe have your family you know come back part-time but really yeah. in in nursing there are a couple of different streams once you go up the ranks you can either move into management you can take the research path and you can become sort of academic research or you can go into um teaching is yeah. the other one you can become a teacher and, and teach and teach nurses so that was really sort of the career option that i thought about and yes i did I did get the opportunity to come to Australia and ultimately settled in Perth. But my my defining moment was the day that I lost most of my hearing. So I didn't have any choice about leaving my career. Wow. I had a 
virus that destroyed the nerves in my vestibular system. So it caused an incredible, um, when the virus would, uh, was at its peak, it caused an incredible dizziness. I had severe vertigo that I couldn't even wow. lift my head up. And this tinnitus so I had this you know tinnitus takes a different forms. some people it's ringing some people it's sort of ticking or hissing mine was like did you hold a seashell up to your ear when you were a yeah, kid yes, yeah yeah that sh- yeah that's what it was like but quite oh. intense and that's all I could hear I could hear this whooshing and I could hear this dull sound and this terrible tinnitus now I Thankfully, the the dizziness settled down, uh, the tinnitus remained, and I was told that there was absolutely nothing that could be done about my hearing loss because it was nerve. It had been caused by this virus. So I had a tiny amount of of sound left, and then there was the reality. So at this stage, I was just about 40, that... I couldn't be a neonatal intensive care midwife anymore because it wasn't safe or practical. It was yeah. too demanding, too challenging, high tech. So I then had to really think long and hard about what would I do for the rest of my career? And I didn't know the answer at that mm. point. I didn't know the answer. That's I, daunting. I did feel sorry for myself for a little while. You know, sometimes we just yeah. have to allow a little bit of self indulgence before we pick ourselves up and yep. put the pieces together. And in those moments, the things that were going through my mind were, you know, why did this have to happen to me? Mm-hmm. What on earth am I going to do for my career? And at that time I thought, well, I'm, I'm 40. Who's even going to give me a job? So I didn't know the answers to, to this, but I knew that uh, I had to do something. So when my kids were little, by this stage I had three. I've got three beautiful daughters and a wonderful husband. So at this stage I had started did an MBA and I thought, right, I'll go back and I'll finish off the MBA. So I fast-tracked. I'd been doing it you know, part-time work, part-time, one unit here, two units there. So I went back and I enrolled full-time and I finished off the MBA. And then I got a job in the Department of Health, so in the Commonwealth Department of Health, Federal Public Service. And I was looking forward to sort of using my health experience but working in in the public service. But unfortunately it turned out to be not healthy at all. It was a toxic workplace where there was a culture of bullying. And I quite naively, you know, I was brought up, Carl, that if you see something, you say something, right? So early on I'd only been there a few weeks and I observed some behaviour towards another person by a couple of individuals that was just not okay Mm. and so I called it yeah I called it and as a result of that I then became the target Mm. of prolonged sustained intensive (laughs) bullying behavior and uh, well my world changed then so not only was I coming to terms with significant and permanent hearing loss I was now in this really unhealthy environment and as a result of that I pretty much stopped speaking out. I became really withdrawn, really isolated and really quite low and just couldn't make sense of, you know, I'd walked away from my career and it was so different. So critical care nursing is all about frontline decision making, definitely teamwork and about getting the job done really. And then I'd moved into the public service and I just couldn't make sense of it. I thought, how does anything even ever get done with all this red tape and these these uh, processes? And so I was trying to navigate that, and then became this this uh, toxic toxic workplace, which was really challenging. And that that was harder to to handle than any physical assault on on my body. This pretty much almost destroyed me. It was really bad. Wow. Um, during that time, I got invited to take part in a research trial and I got a cochlear implant. So that was the beginning of learning to hear again and speak again. If you can't hear properly, it impacts the way that you speak. Yeah. And also the cochlear implant, uh, you have to retrain the brain to hear again using neural 
new neural pathways. Yes. So the artificial sound that comes in from the device comes in at a slightly different time to the natural sound that I still have, tiny amount. So my brain has to squash the two together. And so I was committed to my rehab. It was hundreds and hundreds of hours with the research team. That was one of the criteria of being selected on the Mm. trial because there were more people that could have benefited from the device than there were places available. Yes. But it was a rigorous process and one of the things that I had to do was commit to the the intensive rehab. Some yeah. morning some weeks I was at the hospital with the research team, like four mornings a week. Oh. And so I went through this period and, and during that time in learning to use the device is a very slow process. First of all, when the device was turned on, it was just noise. It was indecipherable what the sounds oh. were. And then gradually I could recognise that the sound, oh, maybe this sounds human. Mm. And then after a few more weeks, oh, maybe this sound is high-pitched or low-pitched. Maybe it's female, maybe it's male. And then after more hours, I could recognise a syllable, then a word and a sentence. And I learned to hear again by, I went right back to beginning reader books. Did yeah. you grow up on Janet and John books? No, very no. early, like Ladybird uh, books, oh. you know, very simple language. And yes. I got those and I would listen to those in a very simple words, very simple, slow narration style. And I would kind of follow along with my eyes as I was listening to the words. So it was an incredibly long process. And as part of that rehab, not only was I spending a lot of time listening, mm-hmm. sounding out words, articulating words, getting used to the way that I now sounded very differently. I definitely knew that I needed to rebuild that confidence that I'd lost through working in that unhealthy environment. So I discovered public speaking and I thought this will give me the opportunity to, you know, get more comfortable, to get some practice in a safe space and to also really fine tune my my listening and my my speaking skills. So when I decide that I'm going to do something, I'm all out. So I got the best coaches, speakers and mentors from around the world and went on this public speaking journey. At this time, I'd moved from the toxic workplace and I'd gone across to state health. WA Health is a wonderful employer. So I was now in a safe space and um, doing some fabulous work in in, uh, health. And I was speaking as a as a hobby awesome. and then you know those uh, birthdays that end in a in a zero yeah. and sometimes <laughs> on those special birthdays we do a bit of navel gazing and we wonder what's next and what's my purpose in life and am I fulfilling my life and what sort of legacy am I going to to leave and it was at that moment when I thought you know I've been given this gift mm-hmm. of a of a cochlear implant and in losing my hearing I've discovered my voice ironically it's my voice that I've discovered and I want to help others to discover their voice and empower others to step up and share their stories and share their messages so I became a public speaking and storytelling uh, coach and pretty soon after that people started to ask me to to coach them so I then decided, okay, well, let's see if I can start a business doing doing this. Yes. And I began my business. Now, I didn't go cold turkey like some people do. I decided to transition mm-hmm. from being an employee to being a business owner. So I reduced my hours, built up my business and sort of juggled, juggled the two because I wasn't sure whether it was going to be for me. I wasn't sure whether I was going to be any good at it I didn't really know they certainly didn't teach you entrepreneurial business startup skills when I did an MBA many years ago yes yeah yeah Yeah, well it's good to be able to dabble and try and have a taster is so important before you jump and you throw all your resources absolutely some people don't have that choice they may be redundant or for whatever reason they've yep. got to jump right in but you know I'm very grateful working in the public service there is flexibility you can access all sorts of different policies to allow you to work flexibly and I I just didn't feel ready to make that that big that big leap I'm, I'm glad I did it the way that I did because there was no pressure it yes. meant that I still had an income I could invest in whatever I needed to help me to set up all the things that I didn't know I needed to learn and yes. find out and set myself up. Hmm. So do you do you feel like you're on you're more confident on path 
now than you were when you became a midwife or are they both similar sort of feelings like you when you were becoming a midwife you were like i know this is it and then now in this career you're like i know this is it at the same level or is this a bit more deeper yeah i think that when i became a midwife that feeling was more like a calling yeah this is feels like a purpose okay and I think that not only, well, there's a, a long period of time passed, so obviously age and wisdom and different life stage and different outlook on, on life and that, you know, facing mortality and yep. realising that life is short and life is precious and we need to make the most of every day. But I, you know, I didn't choose this detour. This was something that was thrown at me yep. and this is what I decided to pull out of it. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss my previous career. I wouldn't have chosen to walk away from it, I don't think. Mm. But I love what I'm doing now. And there are sort of subtle but but uh, real similarities in what I'm doing. And a few years ago, I think it was about four years ago, um, one of my wonderful clients, Venkat, who lives in India now, he introduced me to the front of the room when I was doing uh, some guest speaking. And he'd found out what I did in my previous career and he introduced me to the group as the story midwife. I love it. Man. And it's kind of stuck because I do, I do bring new life into the world yeah but I bring stories into the world yep. and I empower others to step up and share their messages so you know that's that's unique to me I don't know of any other people that are business storytellers that started off life as as a midwife so I'm very grateful doing what I do now couldn't imagine doing anything else but it's more of a, I'm more purpose driven these days than I was before and that could be life experience or it could be this transformation that took place. Yep, and I guess a lot of things are falling in place for you where that calling was kind of you going, taking the step, taking the step, where, like you said, now people are falling into place. You're being introduced and someone uses a line and that's like, okay, that I can combine that into 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 who I am and, and I guess my branding. But also kind of this, when the synergy starts to happen, then you know it's like a real purpose. You, you know that you're supposed to be out there you know, yeah. delivering that. I guess what I want to know some of the specifics of how being a midwife, midwife has helped you in your business and, and, and creating your business. So I, I, I believe that you'd be incredibly intu- intuitive through the challenges, not only um, as a nurse, but also through the hearing challenges. You, you know, you would have had to, how should I say, understand life and receive information in a whole different way like when you're going through yeah. that, that long time of, of of working out and dis- you know yeah. the difference okay what is this that's a male's voice that's a female's voice you really would have had to be curious mm. you know interested and i think your intuition would have had to really yeah be and, up. and focus and discipline as well i mean the focus that it took you know yeah. like sort of 10 minutes of learning and i'd be absolutely i'd need to have a bit of a nap because yeah. it was just so intensive and yeah. you know when we we were a kid we learned to walk and we learned to crawl and we learned to ride a bike and it's only when you have to relearn to do those things when you're older yeah. that you think well no wonder kids have toddlers have so many naps it's because their yeah. brains are just working so hard <laughs> so you're yeah, Nurses have uh, an intuitive superpower that we're tuned in. Sometimes we just know stuff and it's in our gut and we learn when to act on that and when to just let that let that uh, sit. Nurses are very good uh, at observing people. You mm-hmm. know, we, we have, there are, the technology is, you know, there's lots of technology out there. There's lots of diagnostic sort of tools and, and things that we can use. But at the end of the day, it's our eyes and it's our ears and it's our sense of smell and that touch yeah. when we know when what the priorities are. Yes. And, you know, when you think about uh, nurses that work in triage or, or a- any time of, a type of nurse, we constantly work out priorities what needs to be done next who needs most attention and also how we can get the best out of people so getting the best out of people when they're you know tired and grumpy and sick and don't want to be there and are fearful and not don't know what's going to happen you know those skills are also good for coaching as as well so definitely intuition um i'm flexible and adaptable i'm also very firm 
Mm. So there's nothing harder in life than uh, having a baby and yep. uh, becoming a new parent, and it's a whole different different time and stage in in life. And you know, mums and parents put their their life in in your hands to be able to sort of teach and, and educate them. So I find now that um, I I'm able to attract the right type of client who wants to work with me so sometimes you know people will find out that I've got a got a health background or they kind of have a conversation and you know coaching is a very personal thing I yes. think if you're looking for a coach you you, you know you're not going to be you're not going to be distracted by the shiny website or the mm. testimony. You really got to have a conversation and go. You know, are we a fit? And sometimes that might be a discussion around. You know, are our values aligned, or what is it that you want to achieve? And uh, am I definitely the right person who can help you do that? And that's trial and error. You know, in the early days of business, I was more um, broad in my approach, and I would try and help. You know, pretty much everyone. But over the years, I'm now seven years in business, I know exactly who my ideal clients are, who I'm best able to um, help. And I say no to a lot of things now. Yeah. Isn't that liberating? It's liberating, but it's also necessary as well, yep. because in order to be show, to show up and be my best self, you know, I can only have six executive coaching clients at a time. I can only do so many days of, of workshops and, and trainings. Yes. Uh, well, I, I've noticed it in my own business that that screening process is so important. Yeah. Because one bad connection or one you know um, client who maybe is just incredibly problematic and and believes they want help, whether it's yeah. with their photographs, whether it's with um, whatever it is, but they don't really want it and they're just <laughs> going to take you for a ride. That can that can yeah. suck and bleed a business, right? Yeah. You know that that that, that sort of a screening process. I, I love the idea of having a conversation first. And being able to speak, and you're right that that personal touch, because you can see, okay, this is award winning. This is you know, it has got these many you know trophies as this coach, but you really need that that connection, like because yeah. I'm going to go through a lot with you, and I'm going to yeah, open exactly. up with you. You're going to share, you're going to share your thoughts, your fears, your your all sorts of of challenges, and it definitely has to be a, a, a fit. I wonder if we will start a trend for for midwife coaches because I can see the balance of being a <laughs> midwife and how important that is, and also being a coach because it really is that kind of management, that care, that consideration, and then that firmness yeah. when when the times when when you need a launch, you need a launch. Yeah. You know? No, I think that there are plenty of nurses and midwives who've moved into a coaching role, but there's only one story midwife, Carl. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's right, and we've got it here, folks, on the channel today. I hope you're enjoying it. So I'd love to um, move on to a couple more questions that I have. I usually um, finish up with a, f uh, a few few specific questions. However, you touched on kind of that transition and, you know, I look at it as maybe death and rebirth. Like sometimes your old self has to die off or maybe the limiting beliefs of yourself has to die off through experiences and there is that transition that we all seem to have in life where like that was the low of the low moment yeah. and that's the kind of shift that kind of something grows out of that you know mm -hmm. if an animal carcass dies and then you know greenery grows out of that so that's my sort of vision of it but mm -hmm. for for people out there who maybe are saying putting things up like oh you know maybe I'm too old or maybe I've been in this one career too long or maybe you know I don't know how I can turn this career into a teaching career or um maybe my time is gone I guess, you know, what sort of message would you have to people that feel like feel like they can't do it because of the limitations mm. they put on themselves? Yeah, well, one thing that we don't have any control over is every year we'll have a birthday and get a little bit older. So age yes. is, you know, it's going to happen and we've only got a certain amount of time on this earth. So to use age as an excuse or a barrier to not do something is is really not helpful uh, yeah. at all. And I don't know about you, but I've got people who I've had conversations with and people that I've known who have stayed in a job that has not fulfilled them, that yeah. they know that there's something else, that, that really they've always wanted to sell fine art or they've always wanted to have a restaurant or cook for people or travel the country. But what's holding them back is a fear, maybe that fear of, of failure, but often it is a fear that they haven't got the right, the right 
that uh, skills. Yeah. So I guess you know, for me, and I didn't go cold turkey. I did, I did ease out of my career, but I came to the point where I asked myself, okay, what if I fail? Mm. Uh, what will be the worst thing that could happen? The worst thing that could happen will be I have to get a job again. Yeah. You know, that wasn't really the end of the world because I enjoyed parts of of my job. Yes, uh, definitely really knowing what your strengths are and what your limitations are, what it is that you're going to need help in, what are you going to need to invest in in terms of upskilling, training, coaching, you know, what equipment are you going to need to be able to to do the job and run the business. Being um, okay with asking for for help when when you need to and surrounding yourself by like-minded people who yes. are going to support you and be your your cheerleaders and sometimes I found the hard way that when you do go through a big transition and you go through this massive period of growth that some people are not going to stay with you along the journey mm. and that's okay yeah. and and initially when I realized that you know I was going down this path and other people were on a different path I would really try and hang on to that relationship or friendship and and try and be my old self and and now I realize that growing means outgrowing mm. some things and yeah. that might be relationships yeah. and there's a time to just realize that you had a, a good friendship or relationship or companionship whatever it was and okay this is now the new me yeah. and we'll now go our, our separate ways so that was a big learning lesson as well but I think going back to the the age thing is really, you know, asking yourself, okay, am I content doing this for the rest of my life? What mm -hmm. legacy do I want to leave? If I were to die tomorrow, uh, what would people be saying about me? And have yep. I really given it my all? And if you've always wanted to cook or sell fine art, you know, and you, and you die not having given that a go just because of some number, then that's pretty sad, isn't it? Yeah, and I, I, I think there's a connection like that I want to pull from something that you said to me. Um, you know, sp speaking to you is serving. Like speaking to you and, and, and coaching and training, it's serving. And, I, and I'd love to kind of, I guess, dive into that, that mindset of, you know, the difference between uh, I need to find a profession, need to find a role in humanity, need to find my space or my position where I'm not going to be you know, I'm going to be socially accepted and I can keep my friends, I can keep my comforts, I can keep everything. And then the kind of moment where you go, the transition where you go, no, 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 no I'm here to serve in some way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how did that come about? I you? think that does come about with with age yeah. and, and definitely, definitely wisdom. Yeah. There is a time when I felt personally that I've just sort of, dropped into a whole new level of self-acceptance. Mm. So in my younger years, it was about what impression I'm making, what's the perception of others about me, am I a good friend or am I doing the right thing? Or it was really all, all my energy was focused outward, mm. whereas now it's accepting that I am who I am and what I am and as long as I'm showing up and always working on being the best version of myself, that's yes. okay. I'm also okay with I'm not everyone's cup of tea. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't serve mm. serve everyone. And so I think it's that combination of, of of definitely definitely confidence, but growing into, you know, your own skin. I think early mm. on in life, you know, I was in a skin that probably didn't fit me yeah. too well. And I was looking for external validation. Yeah. From various sources. And always wanted to get approval from from others, be liked by others, and and that that's not sustainable. Mm, yeah, it's not sustainable. That 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 I definitely get that same feeling of that being in your skin, being in your body, being in your space. Mm. And I think that's really where things start to come together, and you yeah. know, your heart starts to sing when you're kind of like, oh, I've, and uh, there's times that you know where, where you're out out of your body and you're you're or you're, you're out of you know, your synergy of who you are and how you want to show up. And, and those times can be tormenting because you go, oh, I'm in this role, I'm doing, I'm delivering this thing, yeah. I'm, I'm saying these words in the sales job, you know, but I don't believe them or I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not with it, you know, and, 
that I guess that's another motivation to say, well, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how long you've been in this career, it doesn't matter how comfortable this situation is, you know, where do, how do you want to feel? Do you want to feel like you're in, you're living in your body, you're living in your purpose, or do you want to live someone else's? And I think that's really yeah. it's such a satisfying feeling when you're in, you're in your zone, you're in your body. Every move you make, every action you make, is your confidence. It's your self assurity. Yeah. Your, 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 yeah. I, I think that's something that's really. And the other beautiful. thing that happens when you when you reach my age of maturity is that you you know time speeds up i'm sure it does and and you realize that okay we really need to take it up a notch now we need to really make the most of the time that that we've got to to finish off i think when we're younger we when i look back on my youth i wasted a lot of time mm. you know sleep in today and i won't yep. get there and i drink too much and yes, I, uh, you know yep. be lazy and i procrastinate i'll get that done tomorrow and yep. now i i've got a i've got a packed agenda mm. i'm more appreciative that life on earth is 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 short mm. and i've still got so much that i want to get done and I feel that I've got more energy and enthusiasm now I think because I'm I am deciding my destiny rather than working for the big employer and you know working in the public service is so so much bureaucracy that Mm. it was very hard to cope with that on a a daily a daily basis and get that level of fulfillment whereas when you're the boss you know you make the decisions that are right for the business you get to choose who you work with so you're working with people who bring you joy who inspire you you're working with people and then you just get an amazing buzz when they have a celebration or they success i mean i love it when my clients send me a photo of them on stage and they're like hey like i nailed my keynote and would never have been able to do it without your help and i'm now confident and i've won some business and i i just love it and that's the midwife in me that i've you know i've i've enabled something else to come out into the world i've unlocked somebody's voice and now that's going to to grow so that gives me a lot of joy and while i get the joy i'll carry on doing what i'm doing so i don't think there's any big changes any big changes coming that's beautiful i, I love the, the the cheerleader the kind of you know feeling along the way of the, the the same excitement that they're feeling it's um and i can definitely see that when, you know when you you shot me through something or some opportunities or check this thing out there and i'm and i can definitely see okay you're serving. This is how you're serving. This is how you. This is your true passion because you're wanting to see other people grow and take a hold of opportunities, and you're connecting the dots. You know. Yeah. Uh, I think that's really when you're living in your purpose. So, I guess you know that. I, I mean, you probably aren't asked answered these questions, but I did want to ask you. You know, what lights the fire in your heart? Like, I think along the way of you helping people, and I, I will divert to just one quick story. There was this gentleman that I know and. It's part of this charity organization. It was the same same thing where he he wanted to do so much in that charity organization, and I, and I was there, you know, doing the home visits, helping him, and and he was he was up the top in terms of the the leadership of this big big charity organization. But he noticed bullying, and there was a, a lady who actually wanted to commit suicide, and he had to he went into the office and said, "What the hell is this? This we're a charity organization about you know breathing life into people." not bullying life out of people, you know, and so that sort of thing and where he was trying to, you know, give to like, a, it would be a, a family out in the Western suburbs of Sydney and um, he wanted to give a lot more than just a $50 Woolworths voucher to a family of six who, you know, the daughter had hit her head due to an explosion back in Afghanistan and, and all these different sort of things. So th- there was a lot that he wanted to do and, and his, his environment, he wasn't able to do it. So he eventually, because he was um, challenging the status quo, he got pushed out of there. They announced his um, that he was retiring. Mm-hmm. They they gave him a car and they said, "Oh, by the way, so and so is retiring." And and he so he went, you know, got all these law like lawyers went on this legal battle, and he just went, you know, what? I'm spending so much time and energy trying to fight this. I need to go and create my own thing. And then he created his own charity, and he would literally see a homeless person on the street and pick them up, put them in a night somewhere. He would see how he could get them a job. So really incredible, you know, vision of what he was doing. But he was really finding out that he couldn't do it in the confinements. He had to find a way to serve with his own skills yeah. and create something. So I guess, you know, what what is it that lights that fire in your heart? Is it that seeing you know, the people that you're adding value to 
kind of win and 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 create their own sort of you know life is that what it is yeah that's a really good uh, you've nailed it that's a really good feeling to be able to use my skills to help people step up and be more confident be their authentic self go out there and share their messages with people because we've all got we've all got stories worth sharing yeah. but often people don't think that they have they go oh look my life's ordinary or who wants to hear about my my story and so that gives me a lot of of joy but the other thing that you know lights me up on a on a personal level will be my three beautiful girls so they're adults now you know my youngest is 23 my eldest is in her late 20s and they are just three awesome human beings and when I look at them as strong independent uh, women and and what they're doing and what their values are and and how they give back to the community it, it really makes me feel very proud so the fact that I've uh, done the parenting thing and yep. have come out the other end and the girls have survived and they and they're thriving and you know they're making a difference in in the world one's very creative you know one's all about earth and the environment and whatever she can do and one is a nurse one took oh, after me wow. the second career she did a first career as a hairdresser and now one day she came to me and she said mum yeah I think I want to be a nurse and uh, yeah wow. uh, that that really gives me a lot of of uh, joy definitely definitely it's mm-hmm. inspiring so I guess when you've got young kids you know they're, they're taking different paths and they're coming to you with you know questions and 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 and, and you know where do I go down this you know, way if I become a nurse and those sorts of things? I guess my my next question that I love to finish with, um, or second last question would be, what does deciding your destiny mean to you? You know, what would deciding your destiny mean to, you know, I guess you and and how you would relay that to someone like your daughter? For me, it's all about uh, choices. Yeah. It's about being um, willing to make the hard choices. Yeah about really coming up with what options are available and, and making it happen. Now, there are people in the world who complain about their situation and what they've got or what they haven't got and they have got this sense of entitlement or expectation that other people are going to fix it or come along with the magic solution. But we get to decide, each day we get to decide what attitude we're going to wear, yeah. what behaviour we are going to to demonstrate or in, or um, or use, you know, how kind we are to, to others. And it's knowing that we do have a choice. We always have we always have simple choices within. And sometimes we don't make the right choice. Um, hopefully we do more often than not. But it is a, a learning journey. So just remembering that we get to choose. Always we get to choose. Don't sit around waiting for other people to make it happen. Make it happen yourself. I love that. That's that's inspiring. That's got me excited about the day, the rest <laughs> of the yeah, the coming days. So thank you so much. Um, so where could the audience find you? I, I think I'd love my audience to be able to, you know, you know, I guess devour more of your content. Yeah. You know. My website is speakingsavvy.com.au. I've got a podcast called Business Chat with Lisa Evans on all the podcast platforms. I'm on LinkedIn. I write every day on LinkedIn, which is where we wow. actually met Kyle. I yes. love LinkedIn. And um, I'm happy to give anyone a, a 30 minute like clarity coffee call if uh, somebody wants help to craft their story or build their confidence in, in speaking. So you can um, access that through jumping on the, uh, the website. Guys, jump on that, jump on that clarity session, that clarity call. I know it's a it's a world where so many things are shifting and changing and I think finding clarity in what you're doing and your purpose is just, it's really, really important. So jump on that. Again, thank you so much, Lisa, for coming on. I really appreciate that. I know my audience is going to love our conversation and you've inspired me. So tick tick there and, and thank you. And we're definitely going to be creating things down in the future. So um, or up into the future, I should say. I'm very excited for that. So thank you. Thank you, Carl.